thanks everybody for coming. I'm going to try not to stand in front of the screen, so just sort of motion if I do stand in front of it and block your view. Um, today I'm going to talk about the restoration program that has been going on at CCMI since um, for about 11 years actually when we first started our nursery. And we'll dive into some of the progress that we've made in terms of techniques for outplanting corals and rearing corals in a nursery and share some of our successes and also our future aspirations for the restoration program at CCMI. Um, so first of all, who is CCMI? Um, so we don't have that big of a presence here on Grands Cayman. And so if you do make it over to Little, we would love to have you come visit the station. We are a small organization and we focus on preserving coral reefs and the marine environment, particularly Caribbean locations, and focusing on Cayman. We have a strong educational output, uh, and this involves a lot of local educational groups. So many students from Cayman will come over to Little and take our marine ecology summer camp or marine ecology courses and learn about the marine environment that way. And a lot, for a lot of these students, this is their first time getting in the ocean and learning about marine creatures. And we think that that's just really pivotal in teaching the local children about the ocean in order to get them to care and really invest in saving our coral reefs. Uh, so our research mission at CCMI is actually to promote resilience of coral reef ecosystems through understanding the mechanisms that enable them to thrive and survive. And in doing this, we're looking at modes of adaptation and acclimatization, particularly to global change and human impacts. We are striving to be one of the top marine research institutes in the region, uh, in the Caribbean, and we hope that we are well on our way to reaching that goal. And one of our key signature programs is, of course, restoration, which is what we're going to be focusing on tonight. In order to really reach this goal of investigating resilience, we are also initiating a new laboratory that I will be heading up, which is the Reef Ecology and Evolution Laboratory. So we are starting to set that up with this uh, molecular equipment that will enable us to really get in some more in-depth investigations into physiological mechanisms for adaptation, which we think will set us apart um, and really put us in a prime position to be um, you know, considered one of the top marine labs. So why are we focusing so much on resilience and restoration? Well, there has been a historical decline in coral reefs for the last several decades. And there are many reasons for this decline. Of course, um, we all know about coral bleaching. This has been very prevalent recently in Grand Cayman. If you've gone out snorkeling or diving, you have probably seen the impacts of coral bleaching this year. Um, this is not the first time, though, that coral bleaching has happened or disease has happened. Um, and so here you can see this graph that was done in 1995. So even this is quite old. and. By 1995, you can see that coral reef cover had declined from somewhere around 75-80% region-wide in the Caribbean in the mid-1970s down to about 5-10% to coral cover regionally. Uh, and so this is a stark uh, reminder of how fragile these ecosystems are, and we really need to focus on what we can do to preserve them from this continued loss or complete loss altogether, or if we can even reverse this trend, even if it's just slightly. Um, of course, the major cause for this decline are the two main things, are disease and coral bleaching. And so coral bleaching, of course, is when the water becomes too hot for the corals to survive, and it kicks out its symbiont, so corals get energy, both from feeding on little things in the water like small shrimp and zooplankton, but also from harvesting energy from light with an algal cell that lives inside its tissue. When it gets too hot, it kicks out this algal cell, and this is why the coral looks white or bleached. Um, and if this is prolonged, then the coral cannot recover. If it only happens for a week or two, then there is potential that these corals can survive regain new symbionts and persist on into the future. And that's what we're hoping will happen after this year's local bleaching event. Uh, but there have been several global bleaching events as well that have marked drastic declines in coral. Um, so the first happened in 1998 
Um, and then the second and third happening in 2010 and 2015, and subsequently there have been relatively annual global bleaching events that have happened since 2016. Um, and so this is now a recurring event, and our concern is that as it becomes more severe, um, you know, there's not as much coral left to tolerate this impact and what will be the future of our reefs. The other main impact is disease. And pri you know, prior to this year, I would have said probably the main disease you would see here in Cayman would be white band disease um, like this or black band disease. But um, if you have been watching the news um, and seeing uh, what's been coming out of the DOE, we have a new disease here, which is the stony coral tissue loss disease, which I'll touch on a bit later on in the lecture. Some positive points, though, is that we have actually been doing coral reef monitoring on Little Cayman uh, for 22 years. So this summer marked the 22nd year of uh, annual data that we have collected on the coral reef in Little Cayman. And some great news out of that is that the reefs there appear relatively stable. So we're hovering around 20 to 22 percent coral cover across Little Cayman, which from a regional perspective is fantastic from a historical perspective, perspective is still degraded. Um, however, we feel confident that because this has been 20 years of stasis, that potentially our reefs in Little Cayman are slightly more resilient than those region-wide. So this gives us reason for hope and reason to really uh, persist with our efforts to restore the coral reefs around uh, the Cayman Islands. Um, so, if we're doing so well, why are we actually actively doing restoration? And the main reason is the loss of these two species. Um, so these are Acropora palmata and Acropora cervicornis. And they have been the main drivers of loss of, of coral reef cover regionally. In the 1970s, you know, we hear stories from other scientists that if you were to go out and snorkel, the four reef zone, what is primarily hard pan, now would have been Acropora palmata flats. Um, you would have to be right on the surface and you would risk getting your knees brushed by these palmata flats. Um, and then it would transition into a flat of cervicornis. Now those colonies were hit very hard by a disease, a white band disease, and it caused a rapid decline um, post around 1980 to the levels that we have now. So much so that they are now on the endangered species list. Um, and so, you know, these pictures, while you may think, well, maybe this was in the height of the palmata, this was actually 1999 and this is 2001. So this is not very long ago, and these are the same reefs in 2019. Um, so this is why we are actively striving to try to replicate and maintain biodiversity and genetic diversity of these species in particular, um, because they are really the ones that are threatened to be completely lost in the next decade or so. So how are we doing this? Um, we're doing this through restoration. And we are not the first people to start restoration programs. In fact, these two pictures from the top are from when I was a wee little postdoc at Moat Marine Lab. Um, so that was 2009, and we were doing the same thing there. Um, and now, you know, I've come full circle, and I'm doing the same work again. <laughs> Um, and, but just to a whole nother scale now, you know, this was really small scale when we first started and we were trying to get, to grow the cervicornis on these little pucks out on the reef flats. Um, and then, you know, we sort of learned over time that hanging them on these trees and on, on these lines actually promoted much faster growth and reduced disease and algal growth that was easier to clean. And so that really was the turning point, I think, for restoration programs was, these early initiatives in Florida where we learned what were the best techniques for growing corals in sort of a garden type setting. Um, and so this is the nursery now on Little Cayman. Um, we have quite a large nursery and we are rearing corals of I think seven or eight different genotypes um, that are, were collected from around Little Cayman. And we're trying to keep them all, you know, relatively well dispersed amongst our nursery because they are in fact reproducing and so 
I think two years ago, Katie, in fact, was the one who saw them um, releasing their gametes and reproducing in the nursery, which is really exciting um, because we have, you know, a relatively a good genetic diversity or pool of genotypes in our nursery, this means they can commingle and continue up um, this diversity. And so what we're doing now, you know, we've learned, okay, we can raise them in these gardens, we can grow them really well, um, but what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is getting them to survive um, through climate change, through disease outbreaks, and being able to put them out on the reef and rebuild these populations that had historically existed. Um, and so we're focusing on experiments that are testing different types of outplanting techniques. So does it matter how they are hanging in the nursery, if they're hanging or if they're upright? Does it matter if they're at 50 feet or 60 feet or 70 feet? And what about when we put them back out onto the reef? You know, does it matter if they're directly onto the seafloor? Should we raise them off of the seafloor? Um, you know, how we orient them and will that impact survival in the long run and overall success going forward? So we've initiated a series of experiments. Um, and some of the first, well, the first one I'm going to talk about tonight is um, by Anya Brown. Unfortunately, her name got chopped off on the bottom there. Um, but Anya is a postdoc ha that has been working at CCMI for several years and she really initiated some of these experiments looking at the best techniques for growing corals um, that would lead to long-term survival. So in this initial experiment, um, she was looking at growth of the corals and survival if we raised them hanging from those lines in the nursery or if we put them on a base and had them growing um, upwards towards the surface. And what's really interesting is she found some very uh, significant results. So here we're looking at total linear extension, which is, it just means growth. How big did they get over time? Um, and you can see that the corals that were fixed onto the benthos and growing towards the sea floor did not grow as quickly as those that were hanging from those lines or in the trees. So this indicates that in terms of promoting faster growth, having them hanging on the trees is more beneficial. However, she then looked at the skeletal density of those corals and found sort of the opposite results. So the corals that were fixed onto the benthos and growing up were in fact quite dense and thick, and those that were hanging were less dense, so almost more like bird bones. Um, so you could break them very easily, whereas these were more difficult to break. And this will have implications for long-term success because if the coral is not very dense, it's very brittle, and a storm comes through, it's more likely to be broken off uh, and potentially impacted by heavy wave action. Now, I will say also that sometimes that's a good thing because corals replicate through fragmentation. Um, so just because they are brittle doesn't mean that they will necessarily not contribute to the long-term survival, but understanding that will help us under or determine environments that may be more beneficial for transplantation moving forward. So should we transplant them slightly deeper so that they're less impacted by heavy waves um, if they've been hanging versus if they've been fixed? Um, what's really interesting is you can actually see the difference visually. So for example, this coral had been hanging and you can see that it, they were initially put on these poles at the same size, and so you can see that the growth was significantly more, uh, but they are more wiry and thin compared to our little stumpy friend who's, who's thick. Um, so interestingly, she also looked at survival long term, and what she found was that, you know, she transplanted these corals that were either fixed or hanging out onto the reef, and they all survived relatively well, but they had different growth rates. So she was again looking at this total linear extension or total growth of these corals. Um, and she found actually that after transplanting back onto the reef, the corals that had been grown fixed to the bottom actually ended up growing better than those that had been hanging. So it seemed that they had adapted very well to this natural orientation. And when put back into that orientation, you know, they were ready for that. Whereas if they had been grown hanging, they were adapted to hanging. And so when they were turned upright again, this may have um, stunted their growth. Um, I think 
when we follow these even longer term, it will be really exciting to see if they catch up. Um, are they able to compensate in some way and you know, reorganize and figure out how to grow as fast as those that are fixed? Um, so these are the sites that she has been working at in terms of outplanting. So this is Little Cayman. Um, and so we have these four sites that she's primarily been working on. So the second experiment was, um, regardless of how they had been grown in the nursery, did it matter where we put them in the end in terms of growth and survival? So do corals do better at one site versus another? And so we chose these four sites and transplanted corals a across these sites. And we did a mix of the different genotypes. And you can see that there were very strong differences. In particular, one site, Martha's Vineyard, had very high survival rates. So nothing died. They all survived. They were very happy at Martha's. Um, but they were equally happy at Coral City and Snapshot. Uh, but they did not like Randolph's Ridge. So they were not surviving well at Randolph's Ridge. Um, so this means that the site of location is quite important. What it is particularly about that site, we aren't clear on yet, but that's definitely something that we are investigating moving forward. And if we look at the growth based on these locations, so where outplanting has occurred, you can see that again, the growth rate was highest at Martha's Vineyard, the same site that the survival was highest relatively equal at Coral City and Snapshot, and again, quite low at Randolph's Ridge. So there's something happening at Randolph's Ridge where these corals are not happy, the conditions are not conducive to growth and survival. Does it matter where they came from if they're gonna survive more or less at one or the other of these sites? Um, in fact, it doesn't seem to be that important. So the color now of the circles represents the location where they came from. So for example, Martha's Vineyard here, this red dot represents corals that were from Martha's Vineyard originally and transplanted back to Martha's Vineyard in the end. Um, and same with all of these others. So the shaded areas are those that were transplanted back to their original site of origin. And so it doesn't appear, in fact, that where you come from matters. What matters more are the conditions at the place where you're transplanted back out into. Um, so again, uh, if we look at the scale here, Randolph's Ridge, everything is um, below zero, which is indicating um, a loss of coral survival relative to the other sites. All right, so what about how we outplant them? So the next thing we did, so for Anya's projects, we were actually taking these little coral fragments from the nursery and putting them directly onto the seafloor with an epoxy. Uh, but we were noticing that we were having some problems with diseases and algal growth when we were out planting the corals. And so uh, we saw that another group um, was using a raised surface type out planting method and we thought we would try it here. Um, and so we are using these domes that we're calling them. So these are the domes. And we have started transplanting the corals out and attaching them to the surface of these domes like this, basically raising them off of the benthos to see if that reduces disease and algal growth. And in fact, it has made a huge difference. Um, so when we were, did our first direct outplant onto the reef where we just put them onto the seafloor, um, we had less than 10% survival over a six month period. When we put them out onto the domes, we were looking at more like 80% survival. Um, so this made us really start to think more about how we were going to scale up with these domes. Um, and so our next question was, you know, how does the, the depth of which we put these corals affect um, the success? We know that the dome itself works, um, but does that mitigate the impact of these different site um, conditions. So in May, our Intrepidus team that were over on Little Cayman, they got a huge group of volunteers and they were able to actually set up this experiment for us where we put out um, 10 domes at each of six sites. So three sites were in shallow water and three were in deep water at about 70 feet deep. So that's relatively deep for this species. And then they attached corals all around each one of these domes at the site. 
Um, so in total, there were about 120 corals that had been transplanted out onto the reef. And what we found was pretty exciting. I think it's pretty exciting. So um, if we just pool by depth, uh, this is looking at the survival. So they were outplanted onto the reef in May. And then we went back in October and surveyed again to see how they were doing. And we were pleasantly surprised. Um, so among all six locations, our average survival rate was 89%. Um, so that was really great. We're really happy with that. And it means that we're going to continue to push forward with these domes. Um, and the other thing that we were able to determine um, was that, in fact, depth does matter. So this is a significant difference between depth. So there's a higher survival rate for corals in the slightly shallower waters than in the slightly deeper waters. And we're talking, you know, the shallow water is 30 feet deep and the deep water is 70 feet deep. So you wouldn't think that that would be that large of an impact, but um, for this species it was. And interestingly, when we look at the difference between sites, so if we look at Crystal Palace, for example, deep and shallow combined, or um, Martha's Vineyard deep and shallow combined, again, we can see that really this difference in survival by depth is primarily due to high mortality rates at one site, which is, we call Crystal Palace. So again, this is pointing to the fact that site is very important. So the location in which we're outplanting these corals seems to be the driving force in whether they're going to survive long term. Um, and so what I'm really interested in knowing now is what is happening at Crystal Palace, what is happening at Randolph's Ridge. Um, so I think what we're going to do moving forward is try to do some nutrient work and determine things like uh, wave action, um, availability of nutrients, availability of light, uh, those sorts of things. And also, you know, maybe are there more parrotfish at one site or another that are keeping these corals clean of algae, those types of comparisons to really try and tease apart what's going on here with these intersite differences. Uh, one thing that we did note was that there was the occurrence of white band disease on a lot of these dome corals. So when we talk about survival, I count a coral that has a little bit of disease as alive. So this is not a dead coral. It can potentially recover from the disease. So it's pooled into this percent survival. So you have to then tease apart, okay, well, what is going on actually within these coral colonies? And so we started to look at the percentage of disease amongst the different colonies. Um, so between deep and shallow, there was not a significant difference. So it might look in this graph like there's um, more disease in the shallows, but um, because of the variation amongst the sites, um, that was not significant. But if we look at, again, these three locations pooled across depths, you can see that there is a large amount of white band disease on the corals that are at Crystal Palace. And this is just within the corals that I counted as alive. So of those that are remaining alive at Crystal Palace, you know, 60% of them have white band disease. Um, so this indicates that there's probably going to be even further mortality at that site. But it also really points to the fact that disease is probably the main driver of mortality of these corals that we're outplanting. Um, how can we mitigate that is unclear at this point. Um, there have been a lot of work recently with antibiotics trying to figure out can we prevent the spread of things like white band disease or stony coral tissue loss disease by um, putting antibiotics on the corals. We'll see if that pans out. Um, yeah. Uh, but for a visual reference, uh, so this site here, I hope you can see that you can see all the little white bits of the corals. That is at Crystal Palace. So those are those corals that are alive. And you can see that the white band disease is quite prevalent at that site. Whereas this is Martha's Vineyard. Um, and you can see that there is no evidence of white band disease. So again, it's really site specific and really understanding what's happening environmentally at these different sites is going to be the key to unlocking you know, how we move forward with this project. But we are actually really hopeful um, because we got such high survival after the first six months and especially at some of these sites like Martha's and the site right in front of the lab, which we call ICON, where we're seeing 100% survival. Um, it really means that we're hoping in the next year or two to scale up our outplanting efforts, um, particularly the site right in front of the lab, we're hoping to just you know, 
outplant these domes all over and really create these complex reef environments um, that would hopefully sustain fish populations as well and increase biodiversity. Another thing that we are investigating is uh, resilience and looking at what it is that makes corals survive in one place or another, or is it just an individual genotype that is more or less resistant or resilient. Um, and so we're doing this by looking at what we call thermal tolerance. And I'm hoping to initiate a new project in the spring where we'll be doing this with our nursery corals. And what we do is we bring the corals into the lab, we put them in these little chambers and they're sealed. Um, and then you have all these wires coming in, but the wires are pretty simple. They are measuring oxygen, so the change in oxygen in your container um, and the temperature in your container. So we expose corals to a range of temperatures and we can create these thermal performance curves and then determine if one colony or one genotype, for example, has a higher tolerance for temperature than another. And then we can outplant those corals that have the high tolerance in the lab and see if that actually translates into high tolerance in the field. So does it actually mean anything what I'm doing in the lab or not? Because if we determine in the lab that these corals are more resilient and then we put them all out onto the reef and that doesn't actually affect their long-term survival, then what does all of this mean, that what we're doing in the lab? And so I think that's really the next step um, to apply what I do in the lab and examine things from a mechanistic standpoint to really having an impact on how we restore our coral reef. Um, and the reason we're excited about this kind of work is, um, so I've, I did some initial work in Bermuda and Panama looking at how thermal tolerance different, differs between environments that have different thermal histories. So does your habitat or where you've grown up matter in terms of the temperature you can tolerate? Um, I like to sort of compare it to if you grew up in Canada versus if you grew up in Cayman. You're, you know, a, a Canadian gets off the plane and is like, whew, it is so hot. And vice versa, if we go to Canada, right? We're like, oh God, I can't handle this. So we think the corals probably respond in a similar way to this. Uh, and so, you know, if you've grown up in a cool environment, then your curve, your thermal performance curve will be shifted towards colder temperatures. Whereas if you've grown up in a warm environment, you're gonna be able to tolerate higher temperatures. Um, and in fact, we did find that exact thing, which was really exciting. So um, the corals in Bermuda had a lower thermal tolerance, so a lower maximum temperature they can tolerate and a lower optimal temperature that they preferred to live in compared to corals in Panama. Um, so this does indicate that perhaps corals have this capacity to adapt over their life cycle to different temperatures. It isn't ingrained in them from their genotypes. Uh, and so again, this brings hope, right, to the fact that potentially these corals are going to be able to tolerate increasing temperature as they are exposed to it, as long as it isn't just this like shock. Another thing that I think is really hopeful is I did the same type of experiment on corals from two different depth zones. So corals from 10 feet, or sorry, 10 meters deep, so 30 feet, and corals at 45 meters deep. Um, and you can see that they had very similar thermal tolerances. So we're talking um, dark green and light green and dark green and light blue, and these lines overlap and there was no difference in their tolerance. Um, so this is really important because there's a whole school of thought about deep reefs potentially being a refuge for coral survival under increasing temperatures. And some have posited that potentially these corals that live on deeper reefs aren't used to experiencing warm temperatures, and so their threshold for temperature tolerance is going to be lower than shallow corals. Um, but this work actually shows that they don't have a different temperature tolerance. In fact, they have the same temperature tolerance, uh, which means that they're going to hopefully survive better in the future because they're less likely to experience a heat shock event. Um, so again, that's uh, positive and also leads to our questions about depth and where coral our outplantings are going to survive better. Can we outplant them deeper and deeper and deeper in order to avoid uh, increasing temperatures in shallow waters? Okay, so uh, moving on from temperature, you know, 
Recently, we have had stony coral tissue loss disease appear here in Grand Cayman. Um, so stony coral tissue loss disease affects a wide variety of species. Uh, some it will affect severely. So for example, this Eusmelia is one of the most vulnerable species. And when this disease initially hit Florida, the sites that were affected lost 100% of those colonies. Uh, and so this is can have dramatic effects on our coral ecosystem. Um, and I was lucky enough to go out with the DOE a couple times to the, the affected site here in Grand. Um, and the pattern is quite similar. So there is a very high rate of mortality. It is species specific, but it's a wide range of species that are affected by Skittle D. Um, and so, you know, we are striving to figure out what we do here. How do we stop this? Um, how can we make some kind of preventative measure to enable the persistence of our corals. Is this going to spread all the way around Grand Cayman? Is it going to get to the sister islands? It hasn't as of yet, um, but there's always the potential that that could happen. Um, and the reason that we're really concerned about it um, is because it spreads so quickly and has these extremely high mortality rates. Um, uh, and so some of the work coming out of Florida and Mexico are showing that this disease has just devastated their local reefs. And uh, so we're very concerned what to do here locally. There is a strong concerted effort and it's led by the DOE and they're going out to survey the spread of the disease at all the three islands. They've done a lot of toes and visual assessments of where the disease could potentially be. Um, and it is, I believe Tammy can talk later more specifically about it, um, but it is slightly, um, isolated to a, a general area on the north side. And so I think everyone's fingers are just crossed that it doesn't s spread much farther than that. Um, so beyond monitoring it, we're also collaborating with researchers from the University of Florida and from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and taking bacterial and viral samples of corals that have been uh, affected by stony coral tissue loss disease to try and determine what the pathogen is. Um, so is it bacterial? Is it a virus? We don't even know that much yet. Uh, we know that there are changes to the microbiome or the bacterial assortium with the corals that are affected. Um, but it seems to be a whole shift in microbes rather than a specific microbe that we can pinpoint as the driver. Um, so this is worrisome because we don't know how to stop it at this point. Um, and so this leads me to sort of launching into what we're hoping to start at CCMI in, um, in the next six months or so. Um, but we're hoping to create what we call a coral sanctuary on Little Cayman. And the goal of the sanctuary is to bring in those highly vulnerable species that could potentially be impacted by stony coral tissue loss disease and have a repository at the lab in Little. Um, as well as um, displays of what our nursery and outplanting efforts look like. The idea behind that is that, you know, as people come and visit the lab um, or students come for courses, they can actually see a mini version of our nursery without actually having to even get wet. And this is really great because a lot of these kids can't dive down onto our nursery site. Um, so having that visual reference and being able to actually see that, I think will be a, an amazing teaching tool moving forward. Um, but it's really this, the driving force behind creating the sanctuary is, is trying to preserve biodiversity of these species that may be impacted by stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, and so what is that gonna look like? I'm gonna hark going back to my days at Moat Marine Lab again. Um, and so we had a similar set up at Moat um, where we were rearing all different kinds of coral species indoors um, and in outdoor flumes. It took a lot of maintenance. So this is baby me, um, you know, a decade ago, <laughs> cleaning tanks and rearing corals. Uh, and so this is sort of what sparked me thinking like, oh, well, we could do the same thing here, but with these corals that potentially might die from Skittle D. Uh, and so that's what I'm hoping to set up at at the lab on Little. Uh, it will be smaller scale than what we had at Moat, but that's um, our goal going forward. And in fact, we wouldn't be the first place to do this. So Moat obviously is doing this. 
Florida Aquarium is doing this to save corals in the, in the Florida Keys as well. Same idea to uh, have a repository for the impacts of stony coral tissue loss disease. And the other exciting thing that we're hoping to do is to transform some of our wet bench areas into teaching touch pool tanks. So we're hoping to again use this as teaching tools where we will have the, the touch pool in fact be sort of a mimic of what the fore reef looks like. So kids can come in and see, you know, as they move deeper into the touch pool, what kinds of corals they're going to see and that sort of um, idea. Uh, and it's really just, again, getting kids excited, getting them interacting with the wildlife and with the reef without them having to be able to dive. Uh, because I do think that, especially for local children, this is a big hindrance to their learning and being able to actually touch, you know, a, a sea urchin or a starfish, um, see things firsthand is really what's going to drive home this um, desire to preserve our local environment. And then going forward, our long-term vision is to have a much stronger presence here on Grand. Um, so hopefully in the next 10 years or so, you will see us opening up a much larger innovation center on Grand Cayman, where we do these types of um, initiatives like the Coral Sanctuary and Touch Pools and have more of an interactive presence here with teaching labs to have those local kids able to do programs on Grand Cayman as well as in Little Cayman um, and just really growing our presence and our influence on the local uh, community. With that, I wanna thank all of our sponsors that make this work possible. This has been a long journey for CCMI, so 11 years in the making for some of this restoration work. Um, and we really feel like we're getting to the point where we can start to make a difference in our reefs with this outplanting. So, uh, we, we're thankful for everyone who has contributed and supported over the years. Thanks.